Солнца стремимся создавать условия для очень таких активных дискуссий, дебатов на разные темы, на совершенно разные темы, с приглашением людей из Неуца, с целью создать среду, определенную интеллектуальную среду, где разные точки зрения, разные видения, на общие на какие-то специфические вопросы могли обсуждаться открыто, без табу. И таким образом мы бы хотели, с одной стороны, способствовать повышению качества нашего учебного процесса, но также предоставить нашим студентам возможность получить доступ к другим точкам зрения, возможно, отличным от тех, которые они слышат в аудиториях. Но что самое главное, мы бы хотели таким образом делать вклад в развитие сообщества, того, той среды, в которой мы живем, находимся, разделяя те знания, которые мы здесь в университете создаем, с теми людьми, с которыми университету необходимо жить в одном обществе, в одном пространстве. Отца это очень важный проект по созданию открытых обществ в Центральной Азии и тем самым по повышению благосостояния обществ в Центральной Азии. И это на наш взгляд невозможно достичь без создания либерального общества, общества, которое проповедует разнообразие, толерантность, свободу мышления, свободу собрания, защиту прав человека, защиту ценностей, идеалов гуманизма. И вот сегодняшняя лекция это одна из лекций в большом цикле вот таких вот Open Talks. ACA. И я очень рад, что вот много людей, которые я вижу из-за пределов Новоца пришли. У нас будет еще много подобных мероприятий. А тема сегодняшняя, мне кажется, наиболее близка вот к тому, о чем я сейчас говорил, вот к идее разнообразия. Потому что история буддизма в Центральной Азии имеет на самом деле очень большое наследие получил развитие в Центральноазиатском регионе в Кушанский период. Это кочевая династия кочевых индоевропейских племен основала на рубеже тысячелетний, на, на рубеже эпох, последний век до нашей эры, первый век нашей эры, основала государство. Это чистые кочевники, которые пришли из Ганьцуйского коридора, это вот город Цирэншай, это возле китайской стены. Это самый край Центральной Азии, скажем так. Вот они поселились вначале э, э, недалеко от Ферганской долины. Это кочевники, кто жил в великочевой жизни, жили э, в э, войлочных кибитках, в юртах, перемещались на телеграх, э, осуществляли вертикальное э, кочевание с э, равнин в горы. И вот они основали в конце прошлого тысячелетия на базе греко-бактерийского царства новое государство, Кушанское царство, которое впоследствии стало Кушанской империей. Я сам экономист, но очень много занимаюсь экономической историей для того, чтобы понять, что способствует развитию одних регионов, одних стран экономическому развитию, а что объясняет упадок других регионов, как объяснить, что например, в настоящее время Центральная Азия относительно отсталый регион экономически и социально. А вот, например, зона Средиземноморья и, прежде всего, Западная, там, Центральная Европа – это развитая часть планеты. Так вот, именно с такой перспективы я заинтересовался Кушанским периодом, потому что Кушанский период характеризуется очень бурным экономическим ростом, развитием в Центральной Азии. И Кушанская династия положила начало динамики очень серьезного экономического социального процветания, которое продолжалось, вплоть, на мой взгляд, до 15 века, приблизительно 15-16 веков, после чего начался период упадка и привел к колонизации Центральной Азии, частично Китаем, частично Российской империи и Британской империи. И, на мой взгляд, вот, вот это вот экономическое благополучие, процветание Кушанского царства, когда 
Вода только в Ферганской долине было, 70 городов было, в Чуйской долине было около 40 городов. Бактрия, исторический регион, который контролировался до этого греко-бактрийским царством, назывался страной тысячи городов. Была очень развита система ирригации, азисы были, имели, занимали большую площадь, чем они занимают сейчас, в Сухандаринской долине, например, в Зерошанской долине, в долине Балха и так далее. Главное объяснение, на мой взгляд, вот этому успеху экономическому, это либеральные общественные институты. И прежде всего политика поддержки разнообразия, культурного разнообразия, этнического разнообразия, религиозного разнообразия. Буддизм получил полную свободу распространения на территории Ушанского царства. Он пришел с Ганхары, Пешавар современный стал распространяться, это было, это было течение Малого Колеса, вот Хильяны. При, именно при Кушанах впервые Будда стал изображаться в человеческом обличии. Это было наследие греческого и эллинистического искусства. Таким образом, буддизм дошел до Китая. Но помимо буддизма существовали и другие культы, древние иранские культы, бактерийские культы, манихиизм. Христианство дошло в определенное время до этого региона. Но буддийские храмы играли огромную роль в распространении знания, грамотности. Это были центры, настоящие культурные, образовательные центры, и люди разных конфессий могли приходить и обсуждать проблемы. Это те места, где создавалась не аристотелевская логика, диалектика буддийская. И люди получали образование, были дебаты. И на мой взгляд, это сыграло огромную роль и в развитии торговли. Есть очень много научных работ, посвященных роли буддийских монахов в развитии торговли шелкового пути. Они сыграли огромную роль в этом. Я думаю, что эти рецепты, они применимы и сегодня, и много, очень много научных работ по отношению к Средиземноморскому региону, Западной и Центральной Европе, например, приходят к тем же выводам, что именно либеральные институты позволят им обеспечить на определенном историческом этапе бурный экономический рост и развитие в этих зонах. Так что я, ну, конечно, сегодня речь пойдет, вот я хочу поприветствовать те реквестер, Анатолий Карлина, который будет говорить о буддийском искусстве в Центральной Азии. Это всего лишь одна грань вот этого периода процветания Центральной Азии. Но я думаю, через эту грань мы можем заинтересоваться темой в целом и продолжить в рамках уже других лекций э, дискуссию о том, какой была Центральная Азия, какая она сейчас, и возможно ли вот такой вот культурный, экономический, социальный ренессанс э, в нашем времени. Это большое спасибо вам за то, что вы здесь, и я надеюсь, что сегодня будет интересная лекция, дискуссия. Я бы хотел спасибо, Эрика, за то, что вы здесь сегодня, и за приглашение сделать presentation of Buddhist South in Central Asia. It will be um, very interesting for all of us to listen to you and have a good discussion after your presentation. Thank you very much. Um, we'll be speaking tonight, today. So Erika is uh, majored in history of art and architecture at Harvard University. And uh, from there, she moved on to Cartold Institute in London, where she did um, her master's degree in uh, Buddhist, um, in the history and conservation of Buddhist art. And um, she is also a writer and an essayist, and she is published fairly extensively in um, The Guardian, Slate, um, the New York Times, and she writes a lot about uh, topics related to art in general. So t today, when you will be asking questions, um, I just wanted to let you know that um, um, her interests range fairly broadly, you know, that it's not just Buddhism, that it's art in general. So you might want to, you know, like I said, keep that in mind. Also that over there in the corner, if um, we have Russian-speaking audience, so there are um, headphones that you can take and uh, there is going to be simultaneous translation. And uh, please uh, extend your warm welcome to the Erica. <laughs> 
if we didn't say that we're jumping forward in time by an entire millennium, one might argue, well, it's natural that our religion should spread over time, that's not surprising. But I would argue that we cannot simply take for granted or assume that all religions would naturally seek out more followers. We can contrast Buddhism's highly conversion positive approach with, for instance, attitudes in religions like Judaism, which lacks a real tradition of proselytizing, with the exception of the limited exception of Orthodox Jews who attempt to bring secular Jews back to piety, which is again not an example of true conversion, but rather um, hoping to increase religiosity. Um, one might consider also that the territorial scope of Buddhism far exceeds um, that of its fellow Indic religions, by which I mean Jainism, which was and still largely is restricted to the subcontinent in its diaspora, or Hinduism, which um, had uh, followers in Southeast Asia, but really never made it into Central or East Asia. Um, and therefore, in asking ourselves, why is that Buddhism spread so successfully, whereas other religions, including religions to which it is closely related, did not, we start to see the crucial role, not only that Central Asia as a region played, but also that art plays in this story of religious spreading. By this I mean that Buddhism, in its ideas and explicitly in its scriptures, places an enormous emphasis on the spreading of the teachings of the Buddha as a way to gain merit for a positive rebirth. Importantly for archaeologists and art historians, this does not merely extend to preaching verbally, of which we would have no material record, but also to the production of books, statues, paintings, and other artworks. There is a passage in the Lotus Sutra, for instance, that reads, quote, If there are persons who embrace, read, recite, expound, and copy the Lotus Sutra of the Wonderful Laws, even only one verse, you should understand that such persons have already offered alms to a hundred thousand million Buddhas, and in the place of the Buddhas have fulfilled their great vow, and because they have taken pity on living beings, they have been born in this human world. In other words, the production of books and images of the Buddha was seen as a profoundly compassionate act, motivated by a desire to save the souls of others from ignorance and suffering caused by a failure to embrace or understand what they felt to be the true religion. Moreover, books and images of the Buddha and his sermons are referred to as the Dharmakaya, which is a Sanskrit word meaning truth body and can be contrasted with the flesh body inhabited by the Buddha during his final time on earth, which was ultimately transient and illusory in nature. In a passage from the Vakali Sutra, the titular monk, Vakali, expresses a desire to see the Buddha, only to be upbraided by his religious teacher, who says, quote, Why do you want to see this foul body? One who sees the Dharma sees me. One who sees me sees the Dharma. End quote. Here, the use of the phrase foul body implies that the Dharmakaya, the truth body as exemplified by sutras and works of religious art, is not merely akin to the Buddha's body, but in fact superior to it, while those who view or read the works in question are in some sense in the presence of their Lord. Another way of gaining merit, according to Buddhist thought, would be to donate to support the creation and maintenance of monastic communities and the buildings that house them. Buddhism, especially in its early days, had a very skeptical stance towards money. And so the Sangha, which is the Sanskrit word for the community of monks and nuns, relied upon donations of food um, and other forms of donations to allow them to exist um, and to survive. Thankfully, as we shall see, the extensive trade networks that built up through Asia during this time were able to supply enough cash flow to allow these communities to do far more than eke out a marginal existence. They could honor their religion by means of extraordinary and enduring works of art that gain their donors a shot at a better afterlife, and not to mention a small donor portrait to boot. So all of these religious ideas that I've discussed about works of art as not merely adornment, but in some sense functional objects that brought good things upon those who paid for and made them, would combine to motivate the creation 
of an incredibly rich artistic and architectural legacy throughout the Buddhist world, and help to justify why a religion so profoundly skeptical of the virtue of the material world would nevertheless invest heavily in all manner of decoration, jewels, and the like. We see Buddhist art in elaborately constructed cave temples and the brilliant, if increasingly fragile, murals that grace their walls. We see it in stores of books and paintings, bricked up into sanctums or buried in the earth. We see it in sculptures, large and small, of humble materials and rainbows. So all of this, as I said, accounts for, in a general theological sense, why devotees would have felt motivated to spread their religion and its art. But now, um, let's start looking at particulars and see how uh, Buddhism spread in Central Asia, defined in a broad sense, um, and how its changes over time are both reflected in and advanced by artistic means. So the first chapter of Central Asian Buddhist art that I would like to discuss today has to do in a very fundamental way, fundamental way with how we got the Buddhist art we have today in the first place. By which I mean how the very idea of depicting the Buddha's human form became accepted in the arts in, um, at all. Uh, we are all used to seeing pictures of the Buddha, whether it's a statue in a museum, or sort of design on a t-shirt, or what have you. Uh, however, uh, for roughly the first 500 years of Buddhism, you see a lot of artistic production, a lot of architecture, but none of this art featuring a depiction of the Buddha in his bodily form. Instead, what you get is indirect representation. An empty throne, a stupa, a set of footprints, things of that nature. So here on the left, I'll use my pointer, we have um, what is called an anaconic representation of the enlightenment of the Buddha. So the Buddha is said to have meditated under a Bodhi tree, a type of tree, and during that time, he was assaulted on all, time, on all sides by demons uh, that were led by the demon king, Mara. But he resisted his, his temptations, he persisted in his um, meditation, and he eventually was able to transcend worldly enlightenments. And in this scene on the left, what you have depicted is merely the tree. So here's the tree and an empty, an empty seat with the demons on either side. Um, but you don't have the bodily form of the Buddha. On the right, uh, for contrast, is a depiction of the same scene, uh, which is uh, uh, done in a, a separate place, in which you actually do have an image of the Buddha. So here again is the, the assault, and the Buddha, and the tree above his head. So here again, for reference, is another sort of contrasting and iconic representation of the Buddha, um, again from India, from a site called Nagarjuna Kanda. Uh, and what we have here is a story called The Great Departure, wherein the young prince Siddhartha Gautama decides to leave his royal life behind and ride away in secret in the middle of the night. Um, and his horse is being uh, carried so that the, the sound of the hooves don't wake his parents and stop him from fleeing and eventually um, achieving his destiny of enlightenment. Um, in the first scene, however, and it's not a great photo, um, you have a horse without a rider. Uh, what you have instead is um, a parasol here that's shading what would be the Buddha. Parasols are a sign of, of royalty, um, uh, and so this is a sign that someone, an important personage, is there, but really not depicted. The image on the right, again, is perhaps a more familiar depiction, and here we have not only the horse and the parasol, but importantly, our hero as well. Um, so this is the scene on, on the bottom with the horse and the, the Buddha. This style of Buddhist art that shuns a uh, uh, figural representation of the Buddha is known as aniconic art, and it's somewhat of a mystery today to scholars as to why it should have come about um, in the first place. For one thing, neither of the other Indian religions, Hinduism and Jainism, have any sort of similar um, policy. And furthermore, there is no extant textual support 
uh, as for why this could happen. Um, in all three of the Abrahamic religions, for instance, we can point to areas of scripture, whether it's the Seventh Commandment or certain passages of the Hadith or what have you, that explicitly deal with your creation of images, whether it's permissible or impermissible. Um, and we also have records um, of discussing, discussions and debates about whether or not image making would have been permissible in these religions. Uh, but there is no parallel really in Buddhism. Nevertheless, anatomism was really the rule for roughly the first 500 years of Buddhism. But this, um, uh, one of the key factors in changing this was an area of Central Asia known as Bactria, um, which encompassed part of Afghanistan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and Pakistan. Of key importance here is the fact that Bactria was conquered by Alexander the Great. Um, and this ushered in a time of strong connections between Central Asia and the Mediterranean world, not really Greece. Um, so it's important to note um, that scholars have also drawn connections between um, the art of Bactria um, and uh, Levantine cities, or Palmyra for instance, um, although uh, a lot of historical discussions tend to focus merely on Greece. Um, so this connection between uh, Bactria and the Mediterranean world must one after the disintegration of Alexander's kingdom um, and allows for a time of cultural and religious mixing that eventually trickles down into what is arguably some of uh, the Buddhist world's most famous part. So beginning in the 2nd century BC, a group of nomadic tribes from the deserts of western China known as the Yuezhi people begin to migrate into central Asia. And they eventually conquer and take over the area that was Bactria. Um, the dominant Yuezhi tribe would eventually establish the Kushan Kingdom, um, which would stretch down to include much of what is now Pakistan, Afghanistan, and northern and central India. Uh, Kushan rulers would also begin to make forays later on um, into what is now Xinjiang. And this is when we start to really get an explosion of images being made um, and an end to an iconism in Buddhist art. So the side-by-side -side I have here is a comparison between a Greek statue of Hercules, technically a Roman copy of a Greek statue of Hercules, um, and a Buddhist statue of Vajrapani. So we have the Buddha at the center and flanking him is Vajrapani. Uh, whose name means uh, Thunderbolt Bearer. Um, and he's often featured standing next to the Buddha. Um, so there's a lot to, to note here in terms of similarities. I think it's, it's pretty clear. Um, the image of Hercules um, on the left is depicted nude, as was common in Greco Roman sculpture, um, with defined and realistic uh, or naturalistic musculature indicating a close observation of the human form. Uh, he's further depicted as a strong bearded man holding a wooden staff. Um, and in the image of Vajrapani on the right, you have something that's quite similar. You have a nude, um, or largely nude except for a sort of swath of cloth, a uh, bearded man with defined musculature uh, that is uh, rendered in a rather naturalistic fashion, holding what well, looks rather more like a staff than like. Um, and light light mode. Um, the occurrence of nudity in Buddhist art here is particularly notable because outside of tantric Buddhism, which strives to, in a sense to be transgressive uh, in terms of norms related to sexuality, purity, and death, um, it is really quite rare to have, uh, to have uh, the nude form depicted in this frank manner. Um, so what we start seeing is a lot of direct uh, direct borrowing and mixing and remixing is done in a conscious way, um, of which this is one example. So for, for context, um, this is an image of a Nepalese statue of Vajrapani, the same deity that we were looking at in the previous slide. Um, and in, in thinking back to what we just saw, um, I think it's obvious that um, this piece is coming from a very different cultural milieu. You know, granted, it's from a different country, from a different, very different time period. But I include it just to give you an idea that the form of um, 
of depiction that we saw um, in the previous life, not a given, as in, and is instead really a product of the melding of cultures that we see as a result of the Greco-Buddhist culture um, of Bactria that would be inherited uh, by the Kushan Empire. Um, and as well as borrowing of specific poses and attributes uh, between Greek um, and Buddhist arts, or Mediterranean and Buddhist art, I should say, um, I think we can speak of a more general stylistic melding as well. Uh, we can note, for instance, the attention to detail when it comes to rendering the drapery, um, the softly modeled facial features, um, this sort of thing. Uh, this naturalistic approach, the quite human appearance of a divine figure, all of this is striking, especially when one considers perhaps more familiar Buddhist images, which often have a more stylized or abstracted approach. Um, here, for instance, the Buddha is given um, a head of, of long hair instead of the, the so-called snail shell curls that more stylized depictions often show. The Ushnisha, which is the Sanskrit word for the bump on the head, uh, which is a symbol of the Buddha's divine and special nature, is here transformed into a symbol top knot. Um, something that is you know, realistic, that a real person, a non-divine figure, could have. Um, and all of this is interesting in terms of visual detail, but I think it really takes on greater importance when we understand it as a statement about the relationship between the human and the divine as it was conceived of at this time and in this place. The Buddha here is depicted as a human teacher, approachable, knowable, and not really fundamentally separate from us mortals. Um, and if that is your conception of the divine, um, that has ramifications, of course, for how you worship and how you consider yourself in relationship um, to your Lord as well. Um, another thing I might mention here briefly um, is a couple of technical aspects of the art of this region and this period. Um, so much of this uh, Greco-Buddhist art, uh, so-called, is carved from a stone called gray schist. Um, uh, which, in a certain sense, presents uh, s several technical difficulties um, for the carver. For one, it has a tendency to do what's called uh, delamination, which means that the layers separate from each other. And so the ability of sculptures of this, uh, this place to nevertheless master, um, and pr uh, master this material and produce um, such skillful depictions, I think, speaks to a, a high degree of technical sophistication that was achieved um, in this region. Um, the surviving uh, stone sculptures uh, do not have traces of color. Later on we see plaster sculptures that do, and so we can get sort of a sense of what the, what the temples might have looked like um, filled with color and, and life in that sense. Um, and another thing that I might mention here is um, the reuse of damaged uh, or broken sculptures. Um, so for instance, at a site called Sari Bamal, which is near Peshawar and which is now a UNESCO World Heritage Site, we see large deposits of um, damaged sculptures, um, as well as broken sculptures that are buried um, inside stupas in that region. Um, there is a common misconception um, that Buddhist art does not have an idea of conservation, as, we can, as one conceives of it in the West, that is, um, there is an idea that uh, Buddhist worshippers don't value broken things or damaged things, but I think here in uh, the, the practice of preserving these, uh, these damaged pieces, these older pieces, and recognizing that they have a historical value as well as an aesthetic value, we see um, a, a Buddhist approach uh, to conservation that I think has perhaps ramifications for when we consider um, conservation in the present day um, as well. Um, so another piece of uh, comparison and reference I would like to provide um, is another image of a seated Buddha dating from about the same time as the one we were just looking at, um, which also comes from the Kushan Kingdom, but from the other side of the empire. Um, in this case, from the city of Mathura, which is on the Ganges River. Uh, so here, I think the contrast really helps to highlight the strength of Mediterranean influence uh, in the former piece, and the importance of intercultural mixing in producing um, the art that we have that survives in this region. 
Um, so this Mata in peace, uh, which was not created in a Greco-Buddhist cultural milieu, um, is, I think it's fair to say, much more stylized. Um, the drapery, for instance, is rendered um, as a series of concentric rings. Um, I mean, so here, for instance, it's sort of straight lines. And on the shoulder as well, it's a bit hard to see, but it's sort of straight lines instead of falling um, along the sort of contours of the body. Um, the, cloth, the cloth itself clings to the contours of the body underneath in an exaggerated fashion. And the overall build is quite stocky and suggestive of statues of protective nature spirits or yakshas. Um, to be clear, um, I don't wish to say or imply that a naturalistic approach or a stylized approach is better or worse. Um, people choose to portray objects or figures in a certain way, not necessarily because they cannot do it differently, but because the style they have chosen has cultural meaning to them, is meaningful in a way beyond uh, merely uh, an attempt to mirror the world. Um, instead, I, I really wish to point out these differences um, and how they highlight the importance of Greek influence, Greek and Mediterranean influence. Um, I also want to note in passing um, that I'm emphatically not trying to posit um, the entire arc of uh, iconic Buddhist art history um, as the product of Western influence. Um, as I mentioned, for instance, a number of scholars have looked at the role of Middle Eastern sites like Palmyra upon the development of Greco Buddhist art. Uh, and what's more, it's important to note that um, parallel moves towards iconic representation of the Buddha were occurring um, in centers like Matra around the river Ganges at about the same time. And these seem to have been largely independent. Uh, nevertheless, I think it's undeniable that Greco Buddhist art holds an important place in the overall history of um, the Buddhist art historical canon. Um, and there are ways of framing this, I hope, uh, without falling into the trap of um, earlier colonialist art historical narratives. So, as was mentioned earlier, uh, beginning in the first and second centuries of the Common Era, the Kushan Empire begins making concentrated pushes northward and into the deserts of what is now Xinjiang. Um, in the process, they are able to control the trade routes around what is called the Tartan Basin. Um, and it's at this point that we really see the crucial role um, that Central Asia played in transmitting Buddhism to the east. As the empire expands militarily, we also start to get waves of missionaries heading from Central Asia into China. And this is motivated, as I said earlier, by the very strong Buddhist uh, scriptural notion that propagating the teachings is a meritorious act. Um, as the earliest surviving written uh, records we have of Buddhist monks um, actually going to India to collect Buddhist scriptures themselves, um, is Fajian's travelogue written in the 5th century. Um, China's understanding of Buddhism was, prior to this, largely mediated by Central Asia and its visual culture um, for the first several decades of the religion's presence in the country. Um, as Eva Hong notes in her book, Translation and Cultural Exchange, as Central Asian monks proved invaluable as conduits for Buddhism into China, not only because, unlike their fellow monks from India, they tended uh, to speak Chinese, the ones who went to China, but also because a number of them would have had a bicultural upbringing, such as an education in Chinese Confucian values, um, that would have allowed them to more effectively communicate with their Chinese audience, um, or translate philosophical language into terms readily comprehensible to new, um, to new viewers. Um, and not only was uh, Central Asia a center of Buddhism, but it was specifically um, a center of sutra uh, production, um, and as I mentioned before, translation. Um, it is largely thanks to the work of Central Asian translators um, that Buddha, Buddhism was made not just available, but intelligible to local populations. And the oldest extant Buddhist books in the world uh, come from what is now Palestine. They were found in clay jars buried in a monastery and were written on birch bark paper. Um, though extremely fragmentary, uh, these texts, which are about 2,000 years old, 
um, are notable for the fact that they're written in Gandhari, not Sanskrit, uh, which testifies to a desire for linguistic accessibility. Though, of course, it should be noted um, that literacy at this time was hardly meant. As Buddhism spreads and solidifies in this region, we also start getting monastic communities solidifying, um, often close to oases. In Tajikistan, for instance, uh, the monastic community of uh, Ajina Tepe is founded. Um, its architectural style testifies to cultural dialogues with Sasanian Iran. So an architectural feature called the Ivan, which is a rectangular building with three sides enclosed and one side open, um, was used in Persian palaces prior to this and would later be used as a major design element in both mosques and madrasas um, when the, with the advent of Islam. Today, however, Adina Tepe is perhaps best known for its monumental sculpture of the great passing away of the Buddha, um, often erroneously referred to as the Sleeping Buddha, which is depicted here. Um, though much of this is reconstructed material as opposed to original fabric, um, and it of course has been removed from the site and transplanted into a museum context. Um, in addition to looking at the theological and cultural shifts that we see under the Kushan Empire. I also want to emphasize the technological sophistication and innovations that we see in this art. So the, the statue seen here is one of a pair of famous Buddhas uh, from Bamiyan in what is now Afghanistan. Uh, Bamiyan was a Buddhist area since probably the second century of the Common Era, but the statues themselves were not constructed until the sixth century. Um, so, uh, one is pictured here in the larger, and it had, it had a smaller twin. Um, and a, a third uh, reclining Buddha, which actually survives today. Um, and as sculptures um, constructed in the pre-modern period, um, they would have been enormously complex um, undertakings. They were hewn uh, from stone by hand, then plastered with a mixture of mud and straw, and then coated with stucco and painted. Um, wooden pieces drilled into the stone would have then would have served to fix the plaster layers on. So you can see here a number of holes, and these would have been the supports. Um, uh, the arms, which are now missing, were done separately, uh, modeled around wooden cores, and would have been in uh, a mudra or a, a sacred hand gesture of some kind. Uh, from Chinese travelogues to this region, we know that the statues uh, would have been covered in jewels. Um, and these travelers seem to think that at least one of the statues was made of metal, um, indicating that they may have had uh, bronze face masks originally. Uh, what's more, uh, one of the most remarkable, if little known, things about Bamiyan is that in the niches and caves um, on the sides of the sculptures, scholars have identified traces of oil paint on the walls. Um, which makes this site home of, by far, the world's oldest um, oil paint, six centuries before Jan van Eyck, who was the Flemish painter widely and erroneously credited with inventing um, oil paint. Um, so speaking of the caves at the side of Bamiyan brings me to my next point, which is that while a number of, of freestanding structures with Buddhist history survive, Many of the most famous extant examples of Central Asian Buddhist art um, come in the form of painted cave temples, um, a number of which survive in the desert regions of western China along the former Silk Road. Uh, the term cave temple is a bit of a misnomer uh, because in reality these sites were deliberately excavated archaeological space, uh, excuse me, architectural spaces not, as the name suggests, repurposed natural features. Buddhist cave temples have their origins in India, where you have not only Buddhist, but also Hindu and Jain examples. Uh, these temples further south tended to mimic wooden architecture and form, and often included elaborate carvings, both inside and outside. However, the sandstone that characterizes much of the geography um, in Western China and other parts of Central Asia made comparable carvings difficult, if not uh, impossible. So instead, what we tend to get 
is enormously inventive wall painting. And when one talks about wall painting on mud walls, um, this sort of flat term, uh, murals, really obscures what I think is an enormous degree of technological and technical sophistication, um, which would have necessitated not only years of training on the part of an individual artist, but also possibly centuries of trial and error in order to perfect. Uh, what looks at first glance to be a simple wall is in fact composed of numerous layers of plaster that have been painstakingly mixed with different additives. Plant matter or hair, including human hair, would be added to allow the earth to grip the stone walls, while sand would also be added in just the right amount to prevent the plaster from cracking as it dried. With each additional layer of earth, the additive would grow finer and finer. Uh, so the base layer might be quite rough with a lot of uh, woody matter in order to help it grip the stone wall. While the last layer would only contain very wispy and fine plant matter or hair so that the texture wouldn't disturb the paint that it eventually supported. In these cave temples, we also do have sculptures, um, but they tend not to be carved out of stone itself, as one might see, for instance, in India. Um, instead, what you have um, are statues that are built up of clay, or sometimes lacquer, um, around a wooden armature, um, similar to the arms of the Bamiyan Buddhas that we were discussing earlier. Um, and again, this is a technique that would be carried eastward along the Silk Road and influence the Buddhist art of China, um, Korea, and later Japan. Um, not dancing, but it's not so important. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, in order to execute the complex um, decorative schemes of these sites, um, artists would often do sketches in red paint using stencils or guiding lines to create repeating patterns, such as the so called Buddha field pattern, in which we see um, tens or hundreds or even um, thousands of Buddhas represented in a single cave. And this repeating motif itself is indicative of a major theological shift, which is the birth of um, what is called Mahayana Buddhism. Uh, Mahayana Buddhism is a form of Buddhism that was born in, probably in India and brought into Central Asia and quickly transferred along the Silk Road by Central Asian translators and missionaries. So Mahayana, whose name means great vehicle in Sanskrit, can be contrasted with Theravada Buddhism, whose name means the way of the elders, and which is the form of Buddhism that is generally, although not exclusively, practiced in places like Southeast Asia and Sri Lanka. You sometimes hear um, Theravada Buddhism referred to as Hinayana, which means lesser vehicle, uh, but that name is perhaps, for obvious reasons, considered um, distasteful and offensive by its adherents. Um, whereas Theravada focuses its worship uh, on the Buddha and on the idea of gradual pro progression to becoming an arhat, or a perfected person, Mahayana focuses on the idea that it is indeed possible to achieve enlightenment in this lifetime now. Mahayana Buddhism takes as its ideal the notion of the Bodhisattva, which is a holy being or individual who postpones their own enlightenment in order to help others along the way to spiritual progression. Another distinguishing feature of Mahayana Buddhism is that the pantheon, the size of the pantheon, explodes. So rather than focusing religious devotion upon one Buddha, you get the idea of many Buddhist, Buddhists existing at the same time and in a sense sort of out of time in a sort of a cosmic realm. And you also get a vast panoply of bodhisattvas who themselves become objects of cultic worship. Um, as, at the same time, the Buddha and other holy figures are seen less as human teachers, which is what we saw in the, um, the Gandharan example we looked at earlier, and more as cosmic celestial beings that transcend our earthly realm, but that compassionately aid human beings nevertheless. <laughs> 
the emphasis on endless repetition of multiple Buddhas, as you see here um, in the, uh, the wall paintings at Kisa, um, is a reflection of this new notion of the Mahayana cosmos as being populated by many Buddhas. Moreover, you also see an increasing emphasis on depicting the Buddha as a he heavenly king, uh, what's known as a Chakravarti in Sanskrit. Um, so here, for instance, um, the Buddha is surrounded by a head halo and uh, a mandorla or a body halo. Um, he's shown proportionally much larger than the other figures around him, uh, which indicates his relative importance. He has is uh, supported by lotuses um, at his feet, um, and so um, there's a lot visually here that really emphasizes a divine or a special nature and separateness from the average person. So, for reference, we see some average people um, at his feet, which are donor donor figures um, here, who probably would have financed the, the painting of this case. Um, uh, so this is a far cry, as I said before, from the Gandharan images we saw earlier, uh, with their emphasis on relatability and humanity. Um, another increasingly common type of subject matter of cave paintings in Xinjiang uh, is images of elaborate paradises, swarms of heavenly beings, and verdant green beauty with lush imagery. Uh, the pigments used in these and other scenes um, are made of, of inorganic materials, um, such as uh, crushed, uh, uh, crushed uh, ore, crushed stones, that are often very precious. So for instance, lapis lazuli is often used to make blue. And this also gives insight into the trade networks that existed at this time, and the value that the societies that grew up around these oases placed upon the artwork that they financed. Um, lapis lazuli is only found in two places in the world, one is Brazil, which is obviously irrelevant to this example, and the other is Afghanistan. Um, in some cases, we also have gilding that has been applied. Um, though a number of sites, at a number of sites, the remnants of gold leaf has been scraped off in the intervening years. Um, nevertheless, through looking at the art, we get a sense of the ex um, extensive nature of trade networks, the wealth that was coming into these areas, and the piety of the community such that they would expend um, their wealth and their precious materials upon the um, adornment and adoration of these images. Another thing we get a sense of is the diversity um, of these communities um, in a, uh, an ethnic sense and a religious sense. Uh, Central Asia's flourishing trade routes meant that it was an area of cultural and religious mixing. Um, in addition to Buddhism, we also saw the presence of Nestorian Christianity, um, the presence of Manichaeanism, uh, which is originally an Iranian religion that focused on dualities. Um, and as such, it's not surprising that this wealth of different cultural influences is testified to in the artwork, including at Buddhist sites. Um, so in Buddhist wall paintings, uh, one prominent motif that we often see is what's called a pearl roundel, which is a design element that has its roots in Sasanian Persia, and which traveled um, through Central Asia and into China and eventually Japan. Um, we also see the direct depiction of various religious and ethnic groups um, in quite keenly observed ways. These aren't caricatures, these are, um, these are sensitive depictions. So here, for instance, the donor figures that I pointed out um, have been genuinely, generally identified as um, Sogdians. Um, and here is a, a different painting from the same site where we have a procession of female Uyghur donors who can be identified um, by their, their hairstyle. Um, so the overall vision I think this gives us is of a mixed society that came together both in patronage of this artwork and ultimately um, within the constructive worlds of the artworks themselves. And I think this speaks to the um, themes of, of uh, liberalism and tolerance um, that Dr. Shimshia was speaking about earlier. Um, so in closing, sort of in contrast, um, I want to talk a little bit about the state of this art today. So what are some conservation challenges, for instance, and how might we safeguard this cultural heritage
heritage for the generations to come. And earlier in my talk, I discussed the Bamiyan Buddhas of Afghanistan. And as many of you may perhaps know, in March of 2001, um, these two standing statues were destroyed um, on the orders of Muhammad Umar, who was a Tal Taliban leader. Um, who had the bombing filmed and broadcast um, sort of a deliberately um, inflammatory gesture. Um, another major Buddhist site in Afghanistan, Nesainak, is endangered by the fact that it sits on top of major deposits of copper ore, um, an economic temptation that is perhaps difficult to resist, even if it's doubtful how much direct benefit um, the mine, which is run by Chinese contractors, would actually bring to the local economy itself. Um, and climate change, which is causing desertification, temperature fluctuations, extreme flooding, and other unpredictable weather events, uh, presents an increasing challenge to Buddhist sites, not only in Central Asia, but um, indeed to, um, um, to all material cultures throughout the world. Um, meanwhile, um, academic courses in conservation, as I can attest, uh, continue to privilege uh, Western material in terms of research funding and curriculum building, uh, meaning that the state of the field, when it comes to addressing the particular uh, conservation needs of non-Western art, such as how one might preserve um, paintings done on mud plaster as opposed to the types of plaster that you see in Renaissance frescoes, for instance, lags unfairly behind. Um, while international bodies that fund heritage preservation, like UNESCO, present a number of barriers to entry uh, for countries in the global south. While Buddhism's artistic heritage um, in Central Asia and elsewhere faces uh, mounting economic, political, and climatic challenges, understanding its history and importance in the development of world art, and as an exemplification of um, tolerance and coexistence, is, I believe, an important first step um, in resolving to change the situation. Thank you. Um, so I believe now we can open it up for questions. Первый слайд, который был у вас показан в презентации, это наших киргизстанских памятников. Вот хотелось бы знать ваше мнение о месте памятников буддизма Кыргызстана в процессе распространения буддийского искусства в Центральной Азии. Спасибо. images 
of, of crust and hydrogen, uh, uh, to illustrate this slide with, it was uh, actually very difficult to find non-black and white images, um, um, at least as I was as I was searching. So I think that um, there was certainly influence, there were certainly centers, but as I say, um, there are uh, structural uh, and historic uh, inequalities in how uh, research is allocated and research uh, funding is given uh, that I think render my response to your question perhaps unsatisfactory. Um, but uh, I would apologize for that and I would hope that um, these sorts of inequalities are addressed in the future. Thanks for the great presentation. I'm just wondering, uh, when the Buddhism was spread in Central Asia, uh, one thing is to practice Buddhism, another thing is to, is to make art. And, and uh, how was like uh, how the artists use uh, use the, the local materials to make art? And uh, did they kind of train the local artists, or did like artists come to Central Asia in order to make art? Like, have you looked at these questions? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we know that there was there was travel of artists uh, from side to side. So for instance, I mentioned uh, Dunhuang, which is in Gansu, and we know that there were um, artists coming from other places um, to that site. Um, we also see, of course, uh, traded materials, as I mentioned, so lapis lazuli. Um, we also see trade, for instance, in um, palm leaves, which are grown in in India, but uh, used to make Buddhist manuscripts far and wide, um, including in places where these trees would never grow. And I think that this points to um, an emphasis on trying to create a strong connection to the home, the Buddhist homeland of India, by material means. Um, so we see a lot of movement of material as as well as artists. Um, does that, does that sort of answer your, your question? Yeah? Thank you. Yeah? Can I ask? Um, this is a connection to the earlier question. It's a rather annoying footnote question. Okay. Um, how do we actually inspire or fund or promote this research into this area and research into studying techniques which are not Western mm -hmm. and not connected to the Uyghur Buddhist heritage. Is there any suggestions, speculations, any bodies which can assist us in doing this? Sure, um, absolutely. Um, so I think that a number of the uh, Buddhist uh, cave temples that in uh, the former suburb that I have visited have done a really good job actually of training um, local people in the history. Um, so, uh, to go back to the example of, of, of Dun Huang, um, which I visited as part of my master's uh, research, um, I think that for all that it is a, a commercialized site, there's a lot of tourism, I think that they have done really an admirable job of um, inspiring local people to really take pride in a site that uh, for a long time had been pretty marginal. Um, you see a lot of local involvement, a lot of local pride, and I think that that's really wonderful to see. Um, that it's not just a site for tourists, but it is, it is really a place that the local community um, loves um, and um, participates actively um, in the stewardship of. Um, in terms of international bodies that are um, involved in this, um, the Robert Ho Foundation um, is a big one, so they were a funder of, of uh, my master's program, uh, so maybe I'm perhaps biased, um, but they um, so they fund uh, specific uh, Buddhist art um, conservation programs, um, as well as um, galleries of um, Buddhist art specifically. So for instance, they funded um, uh, a new wing of Buddhist art at the Victorian Albert Museum um, in London. Um, they've also funded a number of conservation projects. Um, Japan, uh, the Japanese government has been extremely active in, uh, in funding uh, uh, conservation, for instance, they've done a lot in, in Bamiyan and in other, other areas of Afghanistan. Um, in general, I think what we need to see is 
um, training conservators in these regions. Um, the bulk of academic conservation programs are at Western universities. Um, and while perhaps uh, getting scholarships to, uh, to students from these other regions to come study at these uh, institutions is a first step. Um, we need to think seriously about how um, academic institutions in regions outside the West um, can take steps to foster um, conservation programs that would focus on all of the context. Yeah, thank you, Erika, for the great lecture. Yeah, um, kind of to continue on the question of masters. Um, did you um, met uh, some information, or maybe you worked on uh, the one one side of uh, this uh, question? The masters or artists who worked on uh, statues, etc., different types of art, um, regarding their beliefs. Right, because all this area it was mixture and uh, crossroads for different religions, especially talking about later than seventh century art in Central Asia. A lot of Muslim uh, artists were there. Were there some restrictions or difficulties uh, for the artists who would fulfill uh, or get um, orders uh, for their artworks, uh, religion wise? You know what I mean? Yeah. And then I have come. Okay, sure, so I'll answer that one first. Um, so I think that there's a common misconception that the people who are executing these artworks were themselves monks. Um, this is often uh, the way that it's framed in popular culture, and I think that this is really this is incorrect. Um, so artists at this time, it was conceived of as, as a profession, as a, as a trade or a craft, and so you specialized in it. Um, just as one might specialize in, in carpentry or, or stone Um So it was, it was thought of in that manner, um, uh, sometimes as a sort of a hereditary profession, right? Um, and so because of that, you wouldn't necessarily have to be a practitioner of one religion or another um, in order to, um, to get a job. Um, um, in terms of religious prescriptions, uh, affecting the depiction of artwork at Buddhist sites. I don't know of, of any documentation of that. I mean, for instance, um, a Muslim artist leaving behind documentation saying that they wouldn't depict a, a Buddha for religious reasons. Um, now, that may well be because of lacunae in, in the, the historical record, but um, it may also just be because people compartmentalized um, their professions um, with their, their religious beliefs. Does that, does that sort of go towards your... Thank you. Uh, if I may, uh, yeah. um, regarding the... Um, of course, this is a big, dramatic thing that happens to Bamiyan Buddhas, but uh, this was the destiny, I think, for other sides. You know, mm -hmm. periods like Visit League, for example. Mm -hmm. I've been there and I've seen that it's as well completely destroyed. Yeah, what's the, what's that say? Um, uh, you answered uh, partly, but what's the state uh, of conservation of those uh, sites now, yeah. including Bamiyan? Including Bamiyan. Uh, Bamiyan is an interesting case. This is a very broad question. Bamiyan is an interesting case um, because there's there's been sort of a lot of um, discussion about what to do. Do you rebuild the um, the Buddhas? Do you leave them as sort of a uh, a monument to what happened. Um, do these voids perhaps take on uh, a new meaning that we don't want to lose by, by reconstructing? So there's been a lot of debate regarding that. Um, so uh, ECOMOS, which is which is an international body that regulates um, the preservation of, of architecture um, uh, and, and monuments, has sort of put a stop to any sort of attempts to rebuild Bamiyan in, I believe, 2005, there was a unilateral attempt by, I believe, some German conservators to begin rebuilding um, at the site, and that was stopped. Um, so right now, they remain, the, the two standing statues remain voids. However, in, I believe, 2004, um, they found um, a third statue that had not been um, excavated, but that was mentioned in 
Chinese travelogues, and it's a, uh, an image of the, um, the, passing, the great passing away. Um, and so this sort of provides an interesting coda to that, that story, um, perhaps. Um, regarding the general state, um, I think you're right to know that there's been a lot of um, iconoclasm at these sites. Um, some of it might be religiously motivated. Um, at Dunhuang, there was a lot of iconoclasm by um, Russian soldiers who were um, in those caves. Um, there's also been a lot of damage done by um, people who mean well um, and who see the damage that is being done and who think that maybe we're moving this art. Um, is the best way forward and in the process to cause a lot of damage. Um, so to give an example, um, I was actually discussing this earlier with, um, with uh, Valerie, the, the interpreter, but um, there was an American um, scholar of Asian art, the, the first um, in the United States, named Langdon Warner. So he's a professor at Harvard. Um, and he made excavations um, at a number of uh, sites along the former Silk Road. Um, and what he saw was precisely what you're describing, this kind of destruction. And he thought, if I leave these things here, you know, in 10, 15 years, who knows what's going to last. So what he did was he took strips of linen and he soaked them in a mix of milk and glue. And he attached them to the walls and then he pulled them off, like ripping off a bandage. This is a technique called strappo in Italian. And it is one way of removing um, wall paintings from the wall. Another would be to remove the wall. Um, which is perhaps more violent. Um, so he took these paintings, as they say, from, from Dunhuang, um, and he shipped them to the Harvard Art Museum, where they still are today. Um, the issue is, as I'm sure you can imagine, such a technique is incredibly uh, violent and incredibly damaging, such that the paintings today are so fragile that they can never be moved. Um, such that the Chinese government the Chinese government certainly thinks that he stole them. They have a plaque at the site where the, where the holes are that says these were removed by the thief line of order. Um, there were a number of other instances of um, what is probably called quite unscrupulous removal by, um, by archaeologists. So Arl Stein, who was originally Hungarian but who uh, worked for Britain, um, was responsible for the removal of um, much of the book material at these sites, as well as Paul Pellio, who was a French, um, uh, French uh, uh, Chinese language scholar. Um, and so this is what accounts for the, um, the depredation that a number of these, um, these sites um, faced. Um, were, were there any other aspects of the question that I didn't touch on? I know it was a broad one, but um, okay, thank you. Thank you. I lost it. Thank you for your lecture. In fact, it's very, I think, historical. In Bishkek and Kyrgyzstan, it is very rare to have a chance to listen about Buddhist art, about Buddhist teaching, about the Shan Empire. Particularly for me, it is very interesting. I'm a Buddhist monk, my name is Alexei, and I'm a representative of the local community, Buddhist community. If you have a chance, we are welcoming you. And I have two questions. Maybe it's not much, uh, uh, how to say, more interesting about your personal opinion about two uh, uh, controversial things, um, which is maybe people nowadays uh, interesting about. What one is it is connection between the local uh, nomadic tribes uh, from the Buddhist Buddha's time. Uh, you know, there is one. Hypothesis that uh, some tribes, like the Saka tribes from Central Asia, came to the India, Nepal, and from this tribe, Buddha appear. It's so one thing. What is your opinion about this? And another about the Jesus Christ. So about the, his uh, possibility of his uh, journey to Kushan Empire. Uh, in the very beginning of it, of course, it was just uh, in the start, but still maybe he, there is such opinion in some Western scientists uh, saying about it. And uh, even some of them said he is become like a Buddhist and kind of came back and started to propagate, but it would change the teaching because uh, the local people, they cannot understand the meaning of the Buddha teaching. So what, two, two questions. Can you kindly <laughs> explain your opinion? 
Um, I've never heard the second theory. Thank you for Um, it's an interesting idea. You know, between 15 years old, that's where you can go. There's nothing. Yes. There's this version. You can find a meaning for the Buddhist teacher, the Buddhist side of it. Or Christ teaching the Buddhist side of it. Sure, and then there are also, um, I mean, there are parallels with a lot of other religions, right? Um, maybe that speaks to a sort of broader values of um, compassion and things of that nature to make it genetic, uh, an argument of genetic connection, I think might require more evidence. So I, I admit that I'm not familiar with the literature regarding this hypothesis. Um, to hear it at first blush, my response would be that it sounds um, dubious. Um, as to your, your first question about origins of uh, the Buddha as related to the Shaka tribes, um, I guess I would just say that I'm not, uh, I guess I'm not versed enough in these theories to really have an opinion one way or another, so I apologize. But thank you, nevertheless. Um, yes, so I had a question about uh, Buddhists in Banyan. Um, in 2008, French and Afghan uh, archaeologists, uh, I believe they discovered a new unearthed uh, version of Buddha that was probably the biggest Buddha. In, in the world, 62 feet uh, long. What do you have to say about that? Um, yes, yeah, so I, I mentioned this briefly um, in re replying to your question. Um, so, I, I guess in, 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 in that reply, I sort of framed it as sort of a coda and sort of a, um, I don't know, it, it seems like a almost a poetic parallel that these things were destroyed and then this this new one which was lost for so many centuries appears. Um, I think that's that's sort of the, the appeal that it has for me even above its art historical value there's something um, some sort of humanistic value or sort of beauty to its existence. This is maybe not such an academic response but um, I think that it is a it is it's just sort of a wonderful a wonderful thought and um, an example of sort of a poetic turn of events that the universe sometimes permits. Yes. Uh, oh, hi. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Eric. A very interesting uh, talk specifically about the um, transmission and the, sort of the geographical aspect of it. Was, um, sort of a very clear account. Um, in terms of the, the sort of just a general question about Buddhist art, I think all the pieces that you showed, excluding maybe the one of the last ones with the donors, which might have just been in detail, um, is there any Buddhist art which doesn't contain Buddha, or is he pretty much present in it, in sort of in all examples? Sure. Um, so there is the the anaconic art that I was mentioning that doesn't show the Buddha in a bodily way, but is still centered around a Buddhist narrative. Um, there's a lot of uh, images of patrons that um, are usually meant to accompany a larger, a larger story. Um, another very common genre of Buddhist art um, is what's called Jataka stories. So Jatakas are stories about um, the past lives of the Buddha before he was incarnated as Siddhartha Gautama. Um, and they are usually um, in the, uh, related to animals sometimes to princes or other humans, but often to animals. And they sort of bear a similarity, if you will, to Aesop's fables. They tell a story in which um, there is some aspect of the Buddha's virtue revealed um, in his animal form, whether it's as a monkey, whether it's as a, as a tiger, or what have you. Um, so this is not a depiction of the Buddha as maybe we might think of him, but it is still related to a broader narrative of the Buddha. Um, another common genre that we get um, is teacher teacher portraits. So, for instance, um, in the Himalayas, um, you get a, a real um, centering the importance of a lineage of teachers that extends back into time, um, and that proves the legitimacy of one line of Buddhism or another. Um, and so the depictions of this, these various teachers, which each have certain attributes that are recognizable, um, is a big, uh, big genre of um, portraits there. Um, you get uh, images of, of uh, monks or teachers elsewhere as well. Um, in Japan and China, for instance, 
Um, and in a couple of these images, uh, you have there have been um, uh, mummies found inside of them. There was a, a um, sensational case, I think, about ten years ago, where they found uh, uh, the remains of, of uh, one of these people within, I believe, a Chinese uh, statue of a monk. Um, in terms of other subject matter in Buddhist art, um, so I guess another uh, common theme would be bodhisattvas. So we looked at uh, Vajrapani earlier. Um, another very common one is called Avalokiteshvara in Sanskrit, um, called uh, Guanyin in Chinese and Kanon in Japanese. Um, and this is a, a bodhisattva who is related to compassion. Um, and so he or she, the gender changes depending on um, what, what country and what time period you're talking about, um, is often depicted saving people, saving real people from danger, um, or um, with a thousand arms that symbolizes the fact that anywhere you are, um, he or she can reach out and save you. Um, sometimes depicted with as, as many as 11 heads, um, again to show that um, he or she can see everywhere and um, save anyone from, from danger. Um, another genre of images that you might see in tantric Buddhism would be uh, wrathful deities, um, which are sort of protectors depicted in a, a fearsome or fearful stance. Um, so depictions of the Buddha are sort of uh, obviously a central, but not the sole subject matter that you see um, in Buddhist art. Thank you. And um, sorry, this might just be a bit too broad, but um, you talked about the sort of the Greco Buddhist uh, sort of influence geographically, and I guess it's the factory and empire and, and that. And, but you were jumping about in terms of when the art was produced. And is geography one of the sort of the biggest influences on, on those changing styles? You know, said a more sort of realistic uh, kind of depiction, or uh, over time, is there are there noticeable changes, sort of maybe again centered geographically in certain areas, or just generally over time? Is it sort of how over the centuries is there sort of a big shift in the way it's depicted? Sure. Um, so we start getting the first iconic depictions of the Buddha in this region around the first or second century. Um, around, if we're talking about temporal shifts in art, another big shift that you see occurs between the third and the fourth century where you start getting a lot of plaster images made instead of solely stone. So that's a material shift, not necessarily a, um, um, a stylistic or um, content related shift. Um, in terms of dating, the main uh, uh, theories that have been put forward to date a lot of these pieces are based, um, well, in a general sense, on things like um, coins that would give a, a rough uh, date, um, uh, but wouldn't necessarily date the statues, right? The coins could have been put there later or earlier, so it's, it's not entirely useful. Um, and then also on theories related to style. So there's a scholar named Ri, a Korean scholar, who has sort of divvied up um, Greco Buddhist art into different stages and argues that the first stage is uh, characterized this way, the second that way. Um, my personal feelings about this is that um, divisions like this that are based solely on um, stylistic analysis without rigorous archaeological um, backing are tentative. Um, and I would be more hesitant than perhaps he is to draw these really clear-cut distinctions regarding period. Um, does that answer your question? Are there any other questions? Maybe it's a specific question. Um, Regarding the depiction of Buddha himself, uh, statues, um, like among historians of uh, Dikar, uh, do you have kind of, um, I guess, um, how can I say, register or enlistment of poses, kind of canonical poses? Uh, if yes, then let's say how many? Why well, I'm asking? Usually, we, we used to see the kind of the same, you know, the, in the lotus pose or, or the lion, 
and then once in only in Korea I saw very interesting clothes like this, you know, just one. Like this. Yeah, yeah, right there with the right hair. Generally, and how it's described canonically. Sure. Um, so there are a number of sort of um, typical depictions of the Buddha, and I don't think that there's any book that says you must describe it this way, you must describe it that way if you're talking about the, the canon of the textual canon. What you do get are artist manuals um, that, that give, for instance, stencils that artists could use or guides about proportions in a very explicit way. Because there was an idea that if the Buddha or um, uh, Bodhisattvas are perfect beings, then their perfection has to be um, mathematically expressed as well. Um, in terms of sort of just listing some of the common ones, so as you noted, the seated Buddha, um, whether in meditation uh, with hands like this, um, or preaching with hands like this, is a very common trope. You see the Buddha standing. Um, sometimes with a hand like this, which is called Abhaya Mudra, which means sort of fear not. Um, or like this, um, which is a gesture of what's called giving boons. So um, dispersing um, sort of goodness upon, his, his, upon the faithful and dispersing salvation. Um, other poses that you see in Thai art, you have a lot of walking Buddhas that are often like, like this, with the very sort of sinuous pose. Um, this is, yeah, this is Southeast Asian style. Um, in terms of other poses, um, you mentioned the, the lying down one, which is often called a sleeping Buddha, but which is a depiction of his passing away. This is obviously um, another common one. So this, these are the sort of main um, canonical depictions. Um, in terms of stories, um, Stories like the great, uh, the great Departure, where he's riding horseback, would be sort of another one. Um, the Meditation Under the Bodhi Tree, um, the first sermon at the Deer Park um, in, uh, in Sarnath. Um, oh, the Skeleton Buddha, yes, which you see a lot of in, um, in Kantara specifically. Um, absolutely, these are sort of common tropes um, in, in Buddhist art. Um, are there any? Yeah. Thank you, Erica. Do we have strength for more questions? Yes, of course. Um, you, you briefly hinted at the notion or the lack of notion of preservation within Buddhism itself. Mm -hmm. How much do you toy with the notion and how much, how much importance would you attribute to this? Like the vanity of earthly material and the, the lack of maybe or at least the ambivalence of preservation in Buddhist art than coming from a Western school tradition where preservation is very important. Right. Do you see attention? Is that something that's methodologically tackled and addressed in your field? Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of um, scholarship related to this. Um, uh, if you're interested, there's a, there's a, um, there are a couple of sources that I could point you to. And unfortunately, the, the titles escape me, but related to um, Conservation in Nepal, for instance. So the main Buddhist um, monument in Nepal is called Svayambhu. Um, and it's a uh, stupa that's believed to have sort of uh, magically um, sort of manifested itself out of the earth. Um, now it's recreated um, every certain number of years. Um, and that sort of recreation itself has become an important part of how that site is worshipped and how people, how people think of that site. Similar to how in Shinto, Isen Shrine, which is the most important shrine in Shinto, is, is uh, recreated every 20 years. Um, now, of course, for an archaeologist or a historian, they would look at the recreation or destruction, I guess, depending on how you think of it, as a site like this and say that you're losing a lot of historical information. And so there is, in that sense, sometimes a tension, particularly when, um, when the act of, of recreation or of obscuring different layers has taken on um, religious significance. Another argument that you sometimes hear um, is a justification of repainting or painting over um, wall paintings with the idea that um, if they're damaged, if they're broken, they're no longer active or they're, they're no longer able to be worshipped. 
Um, I think it's important to step back from um, arguments like these and note that there is no one essential Buddhist notion of what conservation is, just as there is no one central notion of what conservation is in the West. There's a lot of debate um, in, in, you know, across the world about what conservation should strive for, what conservation looks like. Um, and so while undoubtedly there are um, tensions posed and scholars that are grappling with these tensions um, in, I think, really subtle ways, um, we have to be careful in discussing them not to run the risk of essentializing. Also, I want to ask about the heritage of the time of the, or the late, about the 17th century in Central Asia also was a, like a Jungar Empire and in Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan also you can find, for example, not far from here is a Katan, the image of the Buddha in the rock, mm -hmm. and also the same, even bigger, bigger in Kazakhstan, in the river, yeah. and it's also some few places like um, remains of the Buddhist monasteries, did you study about it, and what I want to ask, what do you think about these two images in the rock, because uh, I also traveling a little bit, I mean that uh, Jungar time, um. 17th century, in uh, Isikata here in Kyrgyzstan, if you study. And in uh, Kazakhstan, Isik River, because it is, from my point of view, very unique images, very special technique. Normally it is, um, I even never see another place. Mm -hmm. Because it looks as they uh, using the te technique of the ancient uh, stone carving. So it is not like uh, India, it is not like uh, um, maybe Ganhara or Turkestan style, it's very unique style, they are using the ancient uh, uh, style of the uh, petroglyphs. It's, it's my opinion, maybe it is I'm not right, I just want to ask your opinion about it. Yeah, I'm familiar with the Kazakh examples that you cited. I'm, I'm not familiar with the Kyrgyz examples, so I'll have to look them up, so thank you for mentioning them. Um, in terms of this sort of petroglyph st style, I think that um, you're right that it is unusual that we usually see um, statues or, or paintings. So, so in this in this sense, um, it is uh, it is somewhat uh, less less common. Um, in terms of style, when I look at, at the Kazakh examples, at least, they do put me in mind of um, how the Buddha is depicted in um, images of sort of. Uh, the thousand Buddha motif that you see um, along the Silk Road, especially at places like Dunhuang. Um So I think that there is an iconographic or stylistic parallel, but perhaps the material manifestation of it is more unique.